Alrighty then, welcome to Membrane Transport Part 2. We are going to whip through the rest of this package and just uh, do, uh, yeah, everything that uh, might have miss, been missed in that one we hopefully will touch in this one. I wanted to mention that of course you are aware that this chapter on membrane transport has an awful lot to do with this structure right here, the phospholipid bilayer. I'm going to write that down, a eh? phospho lipid, cut off PO4 group there, PO4, phospho, and then the lipid, um, bilayer. Bi means two, so two layers. So there's one polar head here, polar head, and then there's another polar head down here. By polar, I mean these are the sides that really love water. They are hydrophilic. Well, been to Philadelphia, of course, city of love. Um, so they will orient themselves towards water on both sides, above and below. And then in the middle, this is where we have this region that is lipid soluble. They hate water. We say they are hydrophobic. Hydrophobic. Phobias, right? Terror. Afraid of water. That's a D, honest. Hydrophobic. Um, yeah, so it's called a phospholipid bilayer. There is a PowerPoint presentation that in order to finish off this package, you're going to have to go through and it goes into far more detail on the actual structure of the membrane. Make sure you know what these are, these proteins, very important for carriers, for facilitated transport, active transport. Um, the other little thing I should mention here is that you have a lab to do on membrane transport that involves dialysis tubing. Dialysis. Um, you may or may not have heard of people with kidney problems having to visit a dialysis center periodically in order to have uh, an artificial kidney purify their blood. Uh, the purification process actually takes place because of a differentially permeable membrane just like your cell membrane. This membrane, what you're going to do is you're going to unroll a little stretch of it, you're going to run it under warm water for a while, and then you're going to make a little tubey, a baggie if you like. And into the baggie you are going to put some interesting things. You are going to put a starch solution. And somewhere in your long-legged life you have encountered the fact that the indicator for starch is iodine, in particular this iodine, potassium iodide solution, which by the way is all this lovely brown stuff down here. It's an iodine solution that you're going to place your baggie in it. The other thing in the baggie is glucose, C6, H12, O6. And then the question is what's going to move where? Um, if iodine encounters starch, the positive test here is going to be blue. The starch solution will turn blue. So that's how you will know if iodine is entering the baggie. How will you know if water is entering the baggie? Do you think it'll become um, more turgid, taut, full, um, or will it basically shrivel up if water is going the other way? You, you know the starch and sugar are in the baggie initially, but then you have to test the water in the beaker um, for those two to see whether, um, yeah, they have moved across the membrane. So that's the lab, and you should feel free to do that at any point. Moving on to the actual package, this apparatus is called a thistle tube. Don't know what a thistle is, you really should type it into Google. Look at the images of a little weed. It's like the weed is turned upside down here and then we do things like we put things into the thistle. And what we put in there is a sugar solution. And of course what we do is because this is a lab on the membrane you would actually put a semi-permeable membrane on the end of the tubule. Tubule, tubule what do you want to call it? Tubing. Um, semi-permeable, where have you heard of a semi-permeable membrane? I know, I know, the cell has a semi-permeable membrane. So the question is, 
if we have a whole lot of water out here and a whole lot of sugar inside, where is the water going to go? Is it going to come from the thistle tube into the beaker or from the beaker into the thistle tube? And of course, you're going to immediately you go, aha, I know what this is. This water, this pure 100% water, that would be hypotonic relative to the syrup. There's less water in the thistle tube than there is out here. So water is going to keep banging against this membrane, little molecules of it, and they're going to cross the membrane because it's semi-permeable. Macromolecules like the sugar, they can't go the other way, so they are not going to cross into the beaker. So over time, you should begin to see the level of this rise. So I will be happy if you can write something intelligent in that little box explaining what would happen in this scenario. This, by the way, is very similar to the other page. Both of these are labs that at one point in my life we actually used to do. And then for reasons of uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and things like that, we decided, no, we don't really want to mess with syrup. Um, this is a situation where you put 100% syrup, think of Aunt Jemima, <clears throat> in a dialysis tubing baggie, and then you stick the baggie into a beaker of water. Immediately you say, aha, hypotonic. Let's not say that. No, 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 no. Let's go to this. Hypotonic, because this is a 100% water here, and this is 100% syrup. So, um, in terms of solute concentration, this is hypertonic. And those two terms, if you're ever going to use the term hypertonic and hypotonic, make sure you use them in unison because you cannot have a hypotonic environment without also having something that's hypertonic. You need to be able to recognize both. Which brings me to a question that's actually on the written section of the membrane test. This is an egg, but this is not just any egg. This is an egg. Oh. Did you see that? Egg just burst. Um, we'll get another egg. Anyhow, the point is the egg had the shell removed. It was a raw egg, and we, we have placed it into a hypotonic environment. And what that does is, uh, yeah, well, I'm going to let you figure out what happens in that scenario because the question really on the test is going to be what happens to the egg? You explain it in terms of words like osmosis, diffusion, hypertonic, hypotonic, and you should be fine. Anyhow, very similar to the baggie. We have a hypotonic environment where we have water. The question is, is the water going to go this way or is it going to go this way? And of course, you know what osmosis is. Osmosis is the movement of water by diffusion from an area where it's in lower solute concentration. So in other words, water is going to move into the bag. It's going to go this way. And again, you have the same situation if you have 50% syrup, still got 100% water here. Water is going to continue moving this way. What happens when you have water in the baggie that you then place in the beaker? We would say this is isotonic because now you have equal amounts of water molecules hitting that semi-permeable membrane. If we have little water molecules over here, over here, over here, those are actually water molecules. Um, they are banging into the membrane both ways and crossing the membrane equally. So we would say in an isotonic environment, there is no net flow. There is certainly flow both directions, but over time you don't see one concentration changing over the other. Um, anyhow, the scenario changes when you get to the bottom here, because now we have 100% water here in the baggie and we place it in a beaker of syrup. Question is, is the water going to leave the syrup and go this way or is it going to leave the baggie? And in this case, the baggie is going to shrivel all up as you lose water because now you have hypertonic situation over here and a hypotonic 
situation over here. So you can ignore the mass and weight changes because we don't actually do this lab because we don't want to get sticky. Um, as long as you can give me some sort of rational explanation as to what would happen here, I'm good with that one. That's the easiest way to do a lab, by the way. It's just think about it. This was a page of notes and well, not really notes, because you have to actually label the phospholipid bilayer, say something intelligent about phospholipids, its fluidity, and the membrane proteins. Honestly, you don't need to worry about the different types of proteins as long as you realize their importance in facilitated transport, which is a specialized type of diffusion. And they're also very important in active transport where you need that good old energy currency molecule, ATP. Um, anyhow, the information that you'll get for that particular page comes from the same place you get the information for this. This is a PowerPoint presentation that's on your menu. I apologize for all these nasty teacher things like whiting out certain words, but the purpose of this is to encourage your brain to come to grips with this content and uh, if that is the case, um, you know what really works is if you actually read the PowerPoint out loud while you do this, perhaps somebody in your family might want to get you arrested for this kind of insanity, but hey, you'll be so smart that you can just smile at them and say, too bad. Um, yeah, the last page was just a page of notes. You're going to read those because you care. Um, very valuable summary of the key information in this chapter. Before I go, Bobby's going to disappear here momentarily. But this, this is called Grow Your Own Boyfriend. For 50% of our population in class, um, you're not going to be very interested in this, but I was just thinking that for some of you ladies, a grad is approaching. If you don't have a date, Remind me to stick little boyfriend in a beaker of water by the time grad rolls around. The theory is that by diffusion, osmosis in particular, he's going to be life-size. So, count on it. We're done.